So Kylie Lenlis has the opportunity of, uh, of building uh, and owning all around the uh, world. What resilience lessons uh, do you think that we can take from other countries and apply to Australia? Um, look, I can, I, if we talk through some of the recent resilience uh, work that Len Lease has actually done, and I might just start in Australia, Peter, is um, on Barangaroo. Mm -hmm. um, so it's obviously built right on the harbour, so we're very focused on rising sea levels and the impact that that could have on, on the building. So it's actually built and designed to handle an increase in the sea level and the, the sea wall that's been built. Um, I think where uh, our focus we're having on uh, resilience is actually focused more on demographic changes and how that's impacting. So the ageing population around mm -hmm. the globe. So we're focused on how do we build communities, how do we build to deal with demographic changes as well as environmental changes. So, uh, and practices around the globe in our retirement business, for example, uh, increase in temperature, how can we ensure that it's still safe and comfortable for the residents in those buildings? So, um, areas in healthcare, areas around ageing population and demographic changes are a key focus of, our, of ours in resilience, as well as, you know, sea level and, and the like. D time is fast, ticking away, but uh, one question I did want to uh, ask, which is, uh, might be called the Tina Perinotto uh, question, uh, which is, is this. We've heard a lot about how the concept of sustainability is, is, is changing, but there are also counter voices which are, are saying that uh, uh, if you compare the enthusiasm of the early Green Cities uh, events uh, and the, the land leases and Mervax and Stocklands and ISPTs, say six or seven years ago, pre-GFC, it was higher then. Right? So this is what the critics say. Uh, not Tina, but it's a fair question. Uh, and then the GFC came and it became a second or third order uh, uh, issue and then, you know, now it's, it's all diverse and you're extending the definition but it's, you know, harder for people to put their, their hands on what you're doing. Question, do you think this, the momentum in terms of actually creating a built environment which makes a greater contribution to society is uh, increasing or is it slackened off? Uh, I'm gonna, and I'm going to start with uh, uh, Daryl and, and short answers if we can. Um, I think it's probably slackened off to a degree, but I'd say in the early days it was a novelty and it got a lot of attention. I think there were a lot of vested interests really driving it um, that led to, uh, I suppose, the prominence in the early days. But look, it's no, it's no different to a car. Think back, I'm a bit older than a lot. Cars didn't have seat belts, and yet as a society we were prepared to tolerate people dying in the thousands. Hmm. Now we've got, what, six, eight, ten airbags in a car and it's standard fare. So I mm -hmm. think there's a level of the bar being raised to a point it's at a reasonably high level. As I said, not a reason for complacency, but um, I think it has become an integrated part of everyone's business, whereas before it was the bolt-on, no okay. doubt about it. Okay, well, that is a, a great way to, to frame the conversation. So, Michael, novelty to begin with, uh, but it's, you know, it's becoming integrated, but maybe the pace is slowing. Do you agree with that or disagree with it? Look, I, I, I do agree with that. Um, the GFC did do quite a few things also. It made us uh, harder uh, and it did make us look at ourselves and, and look at waste. So, um, whilst it was a novelty, what, what, what happened is that we, we, we all had a hard look at ourselves and started reducing waste from our organisations and from everything that we do, which in itself is a sustainable measure. So, sustainability has become a core part of everything that we do by breeding a waste-less culture mm -hmm. right throughout an organisation. I mean, you know, even my, my CFO is rampant about people printing, mm -hmm. you know. Stop printing. Why are you doing this? Why, is, why are you wasting money here and why are you wasting money there? That's good culture, that waste less. And if we can carry that sort of cultural attitude all the way through to the business, you know, to the, to the building site about, you know, don't throw away any concrete and don't throw any Rio, then we will waste less and, and use less. So. Kylie, is there some sort of slackening off happening here? Or? No, I think it's increasing. It's certainly increasing in focus okay. and lend lease. And I equally think, and as I spoke before, it's very integrated into the lend lease approach. There's a question here which I might 
deal with, Peter, yep. that links into this. Uh, someone has said sustainability isn't always affordable. Does the panel have examples of tracking this? And this is where the integration is very important and not dealing with sustainability is a separate issue. Mm. So Barangaroo, for example, was a very collaborative approach, very design focused, sustainability focused, economic outcome focused. Typically, when you have a new build of that quality, you're at a much higher price point in the market. So Barangaroo um, has phenomenal sustainability initiatives built in. We had the luxury of a greenfield site, so we were able to design and build. So it actually contributes fresh water to the city. It doesn't use fresh water. The energy efficiency is as best as technology and design can, can develop at this point. So what that has led to is operating costs are 17% lower. And then the design element, how the buildings and floor plates have been designed, it's 15% more efficient. So the impact on the bottom line of the tenants is very compelling. So the sustainability initiatives, yes, probably cost in the design and the build, but have actually led to superior economic outcomes. So I think it's very dangerous, and why I raise it is that integration is so important and you shouldn't look at it as standalone and you shouldn't address it in a cost basis. You yep. need to look at the overall product you're producing, the impact it's having um, and it, its place making and, and, you know, sustainability. Thank you. So, Sue, a final word for you. You know, is there, is there mojo in this thing or is, you know, the air coming out of the balloon? Well, I've spent a lot of the last seven years in, in the UK, so I'm not well placed to comment on the level of energy around this issue here compared to then. But I think there is definitely, I agree with Carly, I think there's definitely momentum and also do agree with the point that it's embedded at a certain level of expectation now. The investors ask for it, tenants ask for it, our staff ask for it, people joining the workforce now work in a different way, they want to live in a different way. So all of those things are pushing um, and I do sense that there, there is a real sustainable momentum in uh, embedding this throughout our organisations and then the impact that we're having on the area of the earth that we're touching. Well, that would be a very positive note to, to finish on, but I did want to... Uh, I've got one second left, but that clock is wrong. Uh, I did want to ask you guys one uh, more uh, question, which is that how can you actually be champions of sustainability uh, and not have the... Uh, the, the, the free spirits and creative, creativity and stamina yourselves. So how is it that you actually maintain uh, your energy levels uh, so that you can be leaders and ambassadors uh, in this uh, area? Uh, and, and, and like short answers, not this is your life, uh, uh, please. Uh, so Rit, you first, please. How does a guy who's jet lagged 12 hour time difference uh, sustain energy? This is a good question I'm facing. Um, Look, it's, it's about the fact that, well, at least for me on cities, I love cities, I'm passionate about them, I want to live in cities for my entire life, so this is all about building the places that I want to live and, and my kids are going to live. Daryl, how do you keep yourself fresh and alive? And I think you've got to have a passion. At the end of the day, if you're not passionate about it, you won't do it, and you've just got to be relentless. And I think Sue mentioned, sometimes you've got to do symbolic things, that can be left field, but I think you've got to just show your organisation that, that you're not going to give up. No one will outlast you. So, um, I would say the power of the idea uh, mm -hmm. is something that, that energises me, the, the thinking from all different disciplines and all different parts of the globe and the power of a new and fresh idea I find personally energising. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go to Michael and then, uh, give a woman the last word. Oh, we, uh, we as a business had to decide what we wanted to be when we grow up, so uh, we got in a room and made that decision. We said we actually want to make a lasting difference to our industry, so that's our... Kylie? I love to have the last word, and I'll keep it short, Peter. I think it's just vision. I think it's purely setting a vision, and then you're motivated, you're committed, and you're inspired. Thank you. Well, the point of this session was to open up ideas that we're going to explore through the rest of uh, Green Cities. We've covered a huge uh, expanse in a very uh, short amount of time. I know that there were more questions uh, that you wanted to ask, but you can still ask them uh, because the, the, the themes that uh, have uh, been explored here uh, will form a thread uh, that we can uh, delve into uh, over Green Cities. The panel have done a great job. Please thank them.